All right, guys. So right now we're going to be talking all about septic shock. And really, uh, the number one reason that geriatric patients are admitted into the ICU, intensive care units, is because of sepsis. Now, how do we know if the sepsis is getting worse or if the sepsis is getting better? Um, really, the number one complication with sepsis is septic shock, and it can be very, very serious. So, your patient comes in with a urinary tract infection. Your patient comes in with pneumonia. Your patient comes in with a cat bite to the hand. Not kidding you. A cat bite. Yes, a cat bite. If that infection gets so bad and it reaches the bloodstream, then uh, your patient has a uh, infection in the bloodstream. That's what's called sepsis. Now, if that infection gets so bad that it starts to mess up, I'm sorry, it starts to infect other organs and it starts to mess around with organ function because we know that blood goes everywhere in the body, right? Obviously. And blood has really only one main function, to maintain perfusion, right? And it also transports drugs and nutrients and all that other stuff. But really, without oxygen, your body dies. So, how does sepsis mess up this pressure, pretty much? How, much, how does sepsis mess up this perfusion and mess up this oxygen supply? We're going to talk about that right now. So, early, early sepsis is really all about assessing your patient in terms of what's going on with your patient here and I made this little chart for us so in early sepsis you have a decrease in MAP okay a decrease in mean arterial pressure now mean arterial pressure what does that mean that means that um, your patient has decreased perfusion to the body and mean arterial pressure just means if you think about low pressure that means low perfusion low oxygen so we get our mean arterial pressure how do we get that what we do is we add up the um, two diastolic pressures so like 120 over 80 let's say two 80s add those together that's 160 then we add a systolic with that systolic is our first number in our blood pressure so 160 plus another 120 that's um, 300 and then we divide all those numbers by 3 and if it's greater than 60 then we are okay okay so it has to be at least greater than 60 60 is the bare minimum of what we should have in terms of the body's barely holding on in perfusion and having oxygen around the body. So anything less than 60 in terms of your map, that means your oxygen is being, I'm sorry, your, your um, body is being suffocated from oxygen. So an early manifestation is a drop in um, in your mean arterial pressure. What this means is that the infection has gotten so bad that it's actually turning off some of the barrel receptors inside the barrels of your body. I call them barrel receptors because there's uh, receptors inside of your blood vessels that help to regulate the constriction of your blood vessels. Now, if you have massively widened vessels, you're causing a decrease in resistance. This causes a decrease in pressure, which basically means a decrease in perfusion of oxygen around the body. So, um, that's the first sign and symptom. The second, is that getting worse? Well, 
we'll go into something called compensatory mechanisms. Your body's trying to compensate. And it's really all about any type of, um, any other type of, of uh, shock. If you've seen any of the other videos on shock that I do, your body tries to compensate with this decreased resistance by increasing the heart rate, increasing the respirations, because we're trying to get more oxygen now. We don't have enough perfusion going around the body. That's the second phase, guys. Your body tries to compensate. The third phase. Third phase is called progressive. This is where the clinical manifestation is huge in terms of our patient gets cold, our patient gets hypothermic. So, cold patient. So anything less than 97.5 or 97 is considered cold and hypothermic for a patient. Now, obviously, assess your patient, um, and, you know, I've had patients who said, oh, I'm just cold-blooded. But, guys, no one is 93 uh, temperature cold-blooded, okay? They're not. Um, pretty much what has happened in this phase, the progressive stage, is that the infection got so bad, and what the infection is really doing is the body's trying to compensate by having inflammatory processes. Anytime you get a cut on your finger, your body has an inflammation process. And inflammation swells up, right? Your, your finger swells up and you try to fight off these, these, um, this infection because the last thing your body wants to do is let that infection go all over the body without putting up a fight. The problem with that is that this inflammatory process in sepsis has gone haywire and now there's widespread inflammation systemically across the body. So how does this look in terms of the progression of sepsis? Well, you have inflammation systemically everywhere in the body. So you have inflammation in the lungs. You have those alveoli starting to break down. Um, you have damaging to the alveoli. So those alveoli aren't able to cough up secretions anymore. Those alveoli aren't able to exchange oxygen like it used to. So now we have damaging. This causes a buildup of fluid in the lungs now and can even predispose our patient to pneumonia. Kind of a bad thing, right? Um, in terms of your, your kidneys, this causes a damaging effect to your kidneys as well because of the inflammation. Now your glomeruli are all inflamed inside your kidneys. Now we have decreased urinary output, right? Because we have those big dilated vessels now, the baroreceptors are inflamed now and turned off. So we have a decrease in resistance decreasing in perfusion so your body tries to compensate in holding on to volume not letting your body pee so if your patient does pee it's going to be very very thick very very brown very very odorous um, very concentrated and this is what we're talking about when we talk about high specific gravity very concentrated specific gravity so, uh, we also know that your kidneys are the ones that make the erythropoietin, the main, main tools that we need to make new red blood cells, okay, or new, um, yeah, red blood cells itself. So, we have widespread inflammatory processes in the blood, okay, widespread systemic inflammation. So lots of bleeding that can be going on in the blood or lots of broken vessels that can be going on from this massive inflammation okay 
Ah. Um, so what happens? What happens when we bleed? How do we stop bleeding? I'm not talking about hypovolemic shock. I'm talking about septic shock. So little tiny um, bleeds going on. Well, your body stops bleeding by putting platelets on the area and patching it up with platelets, right? So how does your patient end up in DIC with septic shock? Well, um, according to the book, the Iggy book, these platelets try to patch up all the inflamed organs. So now all the organs, and really systemically, the organs are inflamed in your body, and they're getting really, really irritated, and to start um, hemorrhaging of just a little bit. So these platelets go, and they try to patch up these little hemorrhages in the, in the, uh, in the body. Now that's all fine and dandy, but your body only has a limited number of platelets in the body. And really, once that limited number is used up, then your body has to regenerate these platelets, and it takes a little while to regenerate. So, it takes a little while to regenerate this fibrin and fibrinogen, which is really just stickies on the end of our platelets that help our blood to clot together. So without fibrin and fibrinogen, and without these extra platelets, the body has systemic bleeding, which then cascades into DIC, which is just a very, very, very bad bleed, which we cannot stop, which is ugly. That's why um, septic shock is really the ugliest when it's really in your refractory stage. So when does all this happen? Well, we're going to get into that. Um, I remember my instructor telling me that uh, she had a patient that was bleeding so bad, who was in septic shock, that they're bleeding out of their eyeballs. And she's like, she's been in nursing for like, I think 20, 30 years. She was saying that uh, a patient was bleeding out of their eyes and they couldn't stop the bleeding. Uh, which is actually really sad, but really bad, obviously. Um, but um, this systemic bleeding, guys, this is what directly leads patients into MODS, multi-organ dysfunction, or basically multi-organ system failure, um, which is all the body organs shutting down in the body. So... Let me stop the video here and we're going to get into some more clinical manifestations of septic shock.